Hi guys, welcome to the podcast. So today I'm trying a new thing. I know that most people don't know who I am, so I'm Tyler, and or Shugs, you can call me either way. And I'm going to show you guys um, my podcast that I'm going to do. This is where I usually do it, is in my little sort of office here. And um, I'm going to do collapsing trachea for you, because I feel like just seeing it is a little bit easier than just listening to it. So if you are listening to this on the podcast part, I'm still going to like explain things as much as possible, but otherwise you can go on to, I think it's going to be on YouTube if I remember correctly, if that's what it's going to upload to. This is my first time doing this, so you have to give me a little bit of leniency here, but um, you can go on and, and watch this as well. So like I said, we're going to talk about collapsing trachea because I feel like this is a really common thing that I see. And I just kind of want to explain things to you. So collapsing trachea, uh, basically like the most classic presentation of this is you're going to see very small breed dogs. So usually like Yorkies, Pomeranians, Pugs, um, Toy Poodles, and Maltese and Chihuahuas are usually the most common ones. You'll see them coming in with this, what I call a goose honk or a dry ha hacking or dry honking cough. So it typically, like, it literally sounds very dry, like literally like a goose. It, it sounds very strange. It is most common in our small breed dogs that are also obese too. So if they're a little bit overweight, um, unfortunately, like they're more likely to get this as well. And the cough can worsen, like it can become something that becomes a life-threatening thing. So we want to try to catch this early and kind of try to figure out how we can manage things the best we can. It's also really exacerbated by warm weather, which is why I wanted to do this now as we're warming up in our weather. Um, I want to try to make sure we can keep them as safe as possible. And it can also be exacerbated by like excitement, stress, um, or pulling on collars and really strong scented things. So if you smoke inside or if you have a lot of really strong fragrances, perfumes, plugins, things like that, that can make it worse. And even sometimes floor cleaners can make it worse too. Like when you're like mopping and the floor cleaner is really strong, that can also make things worse. So we want to try to avoid those things as much as possible. In when you bring them to us, a lot of times what happens is you bring them in and um, we do our first initial exam. Most of the time they're not doing this dry hawking cough with us. So I'm usually asking my clients to like explain to me like what their pet is doing. Just telling me like what it sounds like. Does it sound like it's wet? Does anything come up when they're coughing? Because that'll give me a better idea as to what this might be. You know, especially if this is a really large breed dog, I'm probably not going to be thinking so much about collapsing trachea as I might be thinking about something else. But when I see a small breed dog and I see this and it's something that they've kind of had over the years, but it's just going to kind of gotten worse, um, especially it happens more in the middle aged and older breeds. And it doesn't mean that it can't happen to smaller younger dogs. I do have a technician who her Pomeranian, I think he's, I don't even think he's two yet. And he definitely has symptoms of a collapsing trachea. So we can still have those things in our younger dogs. But like I said, a lot of this is me just asking you questions. What does this coughing sound like? And then other than that, um, we also like, will kind of like, you'll see us like push on their trachea. So your trachea is right here. So we'll push on their trachea. And sometimes that will like elicit a cough or make them cough for us. So we can kind of hear it, but not often. Um, it just happens when it happens. So I'm just going to give you kind of a little bit of overview of anatomy first, and then explain exactly what a collapsing trachea is. So usually, so we have, I am a terrible drawer, so I'm very sorry. It's, this is not my forte. Art is not my forte. But I'm going to try to explain this. So we have in your mouth, you have, then you swallow your food, you inhale, right? And this right here is going to be your trachea. So that is your windpipe. As soon as you take in a breath, it's going to come down this trachea right here. And then it's going to go into our smaller areas here. So those are going to be called our primary bronchi, or it's just the first bronchi that it's going to be right here on either side. Those are going to go down into smaller and smaller little bronchi. So those are called like secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi. Essentially, this is just the way that air is coming in through our trachea down into our lungs. And then it goes down into our lungs here and it ends at these little things called alveoli. Um, that's basically just where air and blood is exchanged. But essentially like this part all right here is where we have our bronchi. This is our trachea. 
So collapsing trachea can happen, like most commonly is going to happen here, which goes through the neck and also the chest. So like the trachea is really long. And then you can also have like some collapsing here in the bronchi, but um, it, it essentially does the same thing, but they're much harder to diagnose. So usually we'll find it most commonly right here in the trachea. All right, so what happens? So we have this flattening of what's called tracheal, or the trachea or the tracheal rings. So our trachea is this nice round tube, right? It's supposed to be nice and round, and then three quarters of it, right? There we go. So about three quarters of it here is gonna have these rings around it. So that, that way it's able to kind of maintain a structure it's cartilage that's in there, so it helps like keep it very round. But then on the top here, so the top part of the trachea is muscle. Now what happens to muscle when we get older, we're not using it, right? And it starts to become saggy. This is the same thing that happens with this muscle of the trachea. So instead of it being a nice round tube, now we're actually more like this. So the trachea sags down and we now have less room inside of our trachea to be able to breathe. You know, here we have a normal trachea, see all that room we have, and now it collapses and we have much, much less room for it. Uh, all the air to come in and everything that we normally would cough out to come out. So these, it, that can happen because like the rings are starting to like weaken and it kind of flattens out like this. That could be because that muscle is just weakened and so it flattens out more like a heart shaped is what I think it looks like. Um, it could be that the lumen or the middle of your trachea becomes just much smaller. So it just become like much smaller like this. And it can also be from um, just like even just muscle intermittently sagging. So sometimes it sags down and sometimes it goes back up. Now the pressure inside the trachea of the neck is actually occurs the most, like there's the most pressure when the dog is inhaling. And so when it's in the neck and it's a collapsing trachea, it'll usually be when they're inhaling. And there's more pressure in the chest part of the trachea as the dog is exhaling. So that kind of tells us when we're going to have um, changes in the trachea when we're doing things like x-rays. Because I can't physically see this when the dog is breathing. You can't see the trachea. So we usually have to take x-rays to kind of figure out like whether they potentially have a collapsing trachea or there's lots of other ways to do it as well. There's like, they can do what's called fluoroscopy, which is super cool. It's essentially like they're taking x-rays, like an x-ray after an x-ray and after an x-ray. Um, so you can see everything moving just in time with it being live. I always think that's super cool, but that is something that you do with an internal medicine specialist, not something you do with a regular veterinarian or with an emergency veterinarian. So, you know, when this happens, that's kind of hard because we don't know, is this going to happen when the dog is inhaling and we need to make sure we get an x-ray on when they're inhaling, or is it going to happen when they're exhaling? We need to get an x-ray when they're exhaling. The other thing is that this is, um, this changes constantly. So it's very dynamic. Meaning sometimes, you know, when the dog is feeling just fine and it's not collapsing, their trachea is very much a circle. And then when they are super excited or they are, um, you know, they are jumping up and down, they have the leash on them and the collar and it tugs on them, then maybe that trachea then collapses just like this. I realize I probably have the paper right next to my, micro or my microphone. I'm very sorry about that. I probably got a lot of crinkling. And I will remember that for next time. But um, it makes it you know, a lot smaller when there's some other big thing that happens. So we don't always see that on an x-ray. And we don't always see that even in fluoroscopy if the dog doesn't have that severe of a collapsing trachea. But sometimes it's there constantly. And we that's just what we're going to see. So why does this happen? We don't actually know. Like there's lots of things that can be a factor. You know, this could be that because of the fact that our dogs, a lot of them are, they have like a lot of complicating factors to this. Um, they think that maybe this is from obesity. So because then we have all this fat that kind of sits on top of our trachea and instead of it just being a really nice round circle, maybe it just kind of like flattens because we have so much fat on top of there. Um, they think that it could be from like things who have for, especially in dogs who have brachycephalic syndrome, 
essentially a breakfast of Alec means a dog that has a really flat face. So I think pugs, bulldogs, things like that, but more in our pugs because they're smaller. So they have a really flat face, and so as they're inhaling, they kind of squish down their trachea. I remember during inhaling, that's when the part of the neck trachea kind of like squishes down. So it could be from that. It could be if they have some like lower airway disease, meaning there's something going on inside the lungs. Sometimes we'll like hear crackles and stuff. Um, essentially, we call that bronchitis, but it's just inflammation of the bronchi. Remember we were talking about, you know, trachea, bronchi all the other bronchi. So it could be that we have some problems with our bronchi or some lower airway disease. It could be from some upper airway disease. It could be that they have an upper respiratory tract infection and that makes their trachea kind of collapse even more as well. They could have things like laryngeal paralysis. All right, this one's gonna be a little bit harder to describe, but when you have your, the very beginning part of your trachea here, there is this little flap that just kind of like sits over it like, Sorry, I get enough paper. Kind of sits over it like this. And when you breathe, that flap opens so that you can take a breath and exhale. And it closes when you go to think, do things like swallowing. So that way we don't get food and fluid and stuff down into our trachea. But that little flap sometimes doesn't work. It's not just one flap. It's actually like technically two flaps that kind of sit over it like this. So when you inhale, it opens and exhale, it opens. And then when you go to swallow, it closes. But with paralysis, laryngeal paralysis, you have one side, if it's, if it's unilateral or one-sided, then one side opens and closes and the other one doesn't. And that makes it so that now our, our trachea that was like this, you know, we had lots of air going in and out, now becomes a much smaller like this. And again, we can't get stuff out, it's harder to breathe in. That happens very commonly like in Labradors and stuff, so I'll go into that some other time. Um, but it could also be that we have, like, they think that there could even be some problems with something called reduced glycoaminoglycans. It just essentially means it's something that's in kind of our cartilage. And you'll see, um, you'll see, like, people giving uh, supplementation for that. And that's totally fine. It's not really going to hurt them. But they think that that leads to softening of cartilage. So they think that the, some dogs could be having a problem with, like, just not enough of those. Another thing that can potentially happen is they can have something called pulmonary hypertension. Uh, in one of my other podcasts, I did one on congestive heart failure. I talk a little bit about pulmonary hypertension in there, but it's essentially where you have your heart that has like these vessels, these pulmonary vessels that are leaving the heart and there can be too much pressure in that vessel. And that can also lead to things like collapsing trachea as well. So lots of other complicating factors to this. Now let's talk about how we're going to diagnose this. Most of the time, this is going to be on x-ray. Um, if I get an x-ray, uh, somebody lets me use their x-rays, I will show you an x-ray of like what this usually looks like. But we're going to get an x-ray pretty much from like where the chin starts all the way down to the stomach. And that's so that we can see our cervical or neck trachea, and we can see our thoracic or chest trachea as well. Remember, this is just a snapshot. Like I said, like if it is not collapsing, if it's open during that period of time, we're not going to see that. We're only going to see it when it actually collapses. So when it actually collapses on an x-ray, that's when we're going to be able to see it and show you what that looks like. It's still really useful though, for like trying to rule out other things too, that there's lots of other things that can cause a hacking, honking type coughing. So like if we're worried about the dog having a really hard, sorry, a really large heart. So cardiomegaly is what that's called, or enlargement of the heart, that might push up on the trachea and cause a very similar thing. We could also have pneumonia, and maybe we thought that it was just a dry cough, but really it's a wet cough, and we're going to see pneumonia on those x-rays. Sometimes you can see signs of pulmonary hypertension. It is very hard to diagnose on an x-ray, and even like even radiologists, like that's all they do all day, all, the, all day every day is read x-rays. Even some radiologists will tell you, we will not tell you if it's pulmonary hypertension. It's just a differential and you have to go get an echo done, which is an ultrasound of the heart. So you now those can be hard to, to rule out, but that's still something that we're trying to do to try to figure out like, is this a di different problem or is this just collapsing trachea? Like I said, fluoroscopy is another great one. Um, it's basically looking at the changes of the diameter of that airway in real time, which is really cool. Like you can see it when they're inhaling, 
and you can see it when they're exhaling. So you can try to see if this is something that needs to be, you know, addressed. Like, those Sorry, my kid's in here. Hey, Abigail, I'm doing my thing. Can you go, please? My podcast. Can you go up for me, please? Or are you going to have to sit here quietly, okay? Okay. So, fluoroscopy is the other thing, like I said. Um, the... The hard part about that, though, is that the patient usually has to be awake when this happens, uh, and that's usually not very easy because they are usually asleep when these things occur. You have to, like, it, it's just hard to do because they move around a lot, and if they're not moving around a lot, great, you can get a really good image of it. The other thing that they can do is a tracheobronchoscopy. So tracheobronchoscopy, that is where you basically, like, get this really good visualization it's like a camera that they put down in the trachea. So you can see when the dog inhales, like what it's doing and when it exhales, what it's doing. You can go from like the, the trachea, you can go down into those bronchi. So again, you can go trachea, you can go down into like the main bronchi here. And even like some little ones, depending on like how small of a camera that they have essentially. But uh, this one, they usually are anesthetized for it. They usually intubate it so that, that way they're able to breathe well still. And it also assesses for like laryngeal dysfunction as well. So they can like look at the those little flaps that I was talking about so that they can see if there's any problems with those as well. Really cool techniques. But again, like the fluoroscopy and the tracheobronchoscopy need to be done with an internal medicine specialist, not with a emergency vet or with a general practitioner. All right, we kind of talked a little bit about some of the differentials already. So some of the other things that this could be, like I said, heart disease, bronchitis, so inflammation of the lower lungs, um, some sort of obstruction of the trachea. So we may have even just like a, a mass or something that could be growing in there that could cause these things. And on an x-ray, it's really hard for us to differentiate between what, um, what like certain soft tissues. Like we can't see the difference between just that muscle and a mass. Other things are going to be um, heartworm disease. So sometimes we'll do like heartworm testing to make sure we don't have heartworm disease causing this. Certain types of cancer can cause this as well. If we have cancer inside the lungs, it can make this like coughing sound too. Kennel cough is another big one. Kennel cough, I've kind of already talked about again in another podcast. You can listen to my other one on kennel cough, but it sounds like a hacking cough. Sometimes it's not so much like a goose honking. Sometimes it's more like a hacking and they'll like, hack something up with it, like white foam. But most of the time it's going to be like sounding very similar to this. And that's not something we can see on an x-ray. We can't do any like obvious blood work initially. You can send out testing to the lab and that'll tell you if they do have kennel cough. Kennel cough is a wide variety of different types of viruses and bacteria. It's not just one thing. So again, sometimes hard to diagnose. So if it goes away, when we don't have it come back again, and probably not laryngeal paralysis, sorry, probably not um, collapsing, collapsing trachea, then probably just kennel cough. And then laryngeal paralysis was our other one, where we have that area inside our trachea, or before our trachea, where we open when we breathe, and then close when we swallow. There is a grading system to our our coughing dogs or for our tracheal collapsing. It's technically from one to four and one is not very bad and four is going to be really bad. So that kind of tells you as to like how, if we're, if it's not really bad, then it might be something we can just do a lot of stuff at home versus if it's really bad, then we have to hospitalize them and look at other options. So typically for, if you come in and it's just coughing, you know, your dog is just coughing. It's not a really big deal. They're not having trouble breathing or anything. It's probably going to mean just doing x-rays, uh, maybe blood work, and then sending them home, possibly on medication if they need it. But let's say you come in and your dog is really bad, like they're a three or a four on our grading scale. They cannot breathe at this point. So a lot of times that means they're what's called dyspneic, meaning we, they are not breathing correctly. We put them into oxygen and we're typically giving them sedation right away. We need them to calm down so that, that way they can open up their airways. Uh, sometimes they're getting steroids as well, just depending on whether they have other problems. Like if they have um, a heart problem, we're less likely to give them steroids if that's the case, because we don't want to make their heart worse as well. And then 
We also have to treat like anything else that's happening at the same time. So it's called treating comorbidities, meaning is there other problems we have to address too? Otherwise, if we can hospitalize them, you know, we would try to get them through this episode, try to get them to the point where they're breathing okay, at least enough to either be able to go home or be transferred to another facility that has um, a, a um, internal medicine specialist who can do some of the other treatments we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Some of the other medical management things, so things that we can either do at home or things that we're going to do in the hospital, are giving something that's called an antitussive. It means basically like to help stop the coughing. So we're trying to like decrease the amount of inflammation in their trachea by helping them decrease the pressure and stop the coughing. Um, possibly using intermittent steroids. Anytime that they are having an episode, maybe we put them on a steroid, a low dose of steroids to try to help decrease that inflammation again. Some people will use bronchodilators as well. So think about our um, like inhalers are a really common one, but it just means it's opening up those airways. So sorry about the wrestling again. You know, so it's opening up these little airways here so that, that way we can get more air into there and not have to worry so much about the fact that we don't have enough oxygen getting into our blood because we can open up those airways. Sometimes using antibiotics is not going to be like an, a mainstay thing. You know, we are we try to be really good about not using antibiotics unless we really need to. But it might be meaning to use antibiotics for if we think that there might be a, a respiratory infection. So if there's an upper respiratory infection, like I said, there's lots of other things that can occur with this and cause it to be worsened. So giving antibiotics for upper respiratory tract infections or pneumonia or you know, lower respiratory tract infections, we're just going to, those are usually the big things we're trying to treat with antibiotics. We're not treating the tra collapsing trachea itself with the antibiotics. Uh, we might give them anti-anxiety medications to go home. So something to help just, again, try to calm them down. So that, that way we don't, they're not like working themselves up and making this worse. So Denophil is another one. Uh, so, so, so Denophil is Viagra, FYI. In case you go to the store and you are picking it up, um, you should be aware of that beforehand. But the cool thing about so Denophil is that they actually had started it to help treat pulmonary hypertension and then eventually found that it actually has this other side effect to it as well. And of course, that other side effect made more money than treating the, whole, the pulmonary hypertension. So when they're treating that pulmonary hypertension, they're trying to decrease the amount of pressure in that blood vessel, in the pulmonary vessels, so that, that way we can get more oxygen through and be able to decrease the amount of pressure in our lungs and in our trachea. The other thing is going to be that if we cannot get them to the point where they are breathing okay at home, they're really bad, then we need to talk about doing something called a tracheal stent. So it's like this tube that they put in. It's like this really big mesh tube. And the whole point is it keeps it really round. So they'll put it into whatever part of the trachea is actually like affected. So like, let's say maybe this part of the trachea is affected. This is like in the neck part, right? But all this trachea down here is okay. So if it's in this part, they're just gonna put the tracheal stent in this part right here. The kind of the problem with tracheal stents, they have found that you know, they've done lots of studies as to like whether this is really helpful or not. We always used to think that this was kind of like the last ditch effort. Go do this when you can't use anything else. But they have done some studies showing that some dogs who have gotten tracheal stents early on in the disease did much better because they were able to like keep all their airways open. They had less secondary problems from it. So they had less like pulmonary hypertension and other things. So sometimes it might be a good idea to go talk with the internal medicine specialist to see like when is gonna be the appropriate time to do a tracheal stent. Here's the problem with tracheal stents though eventually, so we put in this tracheal stent, right? It goes from here to here. Well, right here where we had our, the end of our tracheal stent, it may create scar tissue right there. And instead of it being, being a nice open airway, now we're going to have this scar tissue that makes it even smaller. And then they go in, take out the tracheal stent, put in a larger tracheal stent, but eventually we're going to run out of trachea, right? And eventually you can't put more and more in. But that's not for every case, you know, that's for pretty severe cases when this occurs. Let's say everything goes well, they've been hospitalized. You know, what are some things that we can do at home after they've returned home? Or even if they didn't have to be hospitalized and they're doing well just on medications. So here are some things you can do at home for management. 
Um, one is remove any of those inhaled irritants we were talking about. So candles that are really smelly, plugins that are really scented, really scented perfumes. Um, try to put your dog into a different room if you're going to be using some cleaning material that's really hazardous or like just has a lot of fumes to it. You want to try to decrease all those irritants, all those things that are going to breathe in into their, their trachea. Don't use a collar, use a harness. So just put, you know, you can put a collar on them, obviously, just so we can have identification. So we know who they are in case they get lost and stuff. But anytime you're walking them, use a harness. So you can use the harnesses that kind of go around their shoulders and then attach in the back or the harnesses that go down their chest and attach around their back. Those are fine. Um, the ones that go on their snout, so the, like the gentle leaders and stuff, I love those. But with the ones who are having the, this excessive coughing, I don't think that's always a really good option for them because they need to be able to cough and they need to be able to breathe really well. And if they can't open their mouth enough because you're kind of pulling on it, then I think that we're really doing, we're not doing, um, we're not really doing what it was meant to to be used for. So I think a harness is going to be much better for that. And they even have harnesses that are specifically for pulling so that they hopefully don't pull as well. Restricting exercise, that's always a hard one. So we want to restrict exercise when, if they're coughing during that exercise. If, you know, we're, if they're running around chasing a ball or something and they're like constantly coughing, yeah, we need to restrict that. And maybe we need to do an exercise that is not as extensive or intensive, sorry. Um, I usually suggest for those patients to like walk them instead, like, you know, just try not to let them pull, help just walk them around. We do want them to lose weight if they are overweight. And I think exercise and diet is going to help with that a lot. So if they can't exercise, you know, then not really great. We want them to get some exercise, but we just don't want it to where they're like coughing excessively because if they do, Again, we're going to increase inflammation and that's going to lead them to eventually not being able to breathe and you bringing them into the hospital and seeing me, which I'm always the overnight guy. I'm the guy that nobody wants to see. All right. Otherwise, let's talk about our prognosis on this. So with the grade ones or minimal tracheal collapse, that's actually really good. If they don't have any complicating factors, they don't have heart problems, they don't have pulmonary hypertension, they don't have bronchitis, um, their, their prognosis is really good. They're usually going to do just fine with doing some of these at-home management things. Oh, and I forgot to mention, because I talked about this earlier, you know, in the summertime, trying to make sure that they're not overheated, keeping them in an air-conditioned or just a really cool house so that, that way they don't become overheated. Um, try not to take them, like if you're taking them to the dog park and stuff, try to make it very minimal and try to make it so that they are inside and cool as much as possible because the heat is going to make this worse as well. All right, sorry, back to prognosis. So the other problem is like, as this disease progresses and there are other things that are occurring, so other comorbidities, you know, other problems that they have, um, that makes the prognosis much worse. And so when they're just having like these really like mild flare-ups and stuff, I usually tell people, you probably don't need to see the internal medicine specialist at that point. But if we're having other comorbidities, you know, we have other problems or we have, um, they just, they really are coughing quite a lot you should see the internal medicine specialist so that you can decide whether a stent is going to be the best thing for them, or is this something that that can wait? And if that's the case, like, then they already know they already have their history. They already kind of know, like, do we need to see this dog sooner if they're starting to notice that we're getting worse? And they can talk to you about like the differences in stents, you know, how it affects them, things like that. All right. I think that that's all I got for my, um, stuff for today. I do usually have an animal fact at the end of this, and I'm sorry, I don't have one today. I was really just kind of focusing on like trying to learn how to do this really quickly. So I promise I'll have one for next week. Um, but if you have any questions for me, you know, like I said, you're always welcome to email me. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, TikTok. You can go to my website at vetsplanationpodcast.com and you can email me there directly. And I'm happy to do any other topics that you guys ask for. I do usually do this at night. So I'm sorry if you hear a lot of the, con the commotion today. Like I, I do normally do this like in the nighttime. So I was trying to do this during the day so that you could actually like see me really well on the thing. But we'll see how it goes at night one time. All right. Thanks, guys.